What's up, everyone? My name is Ian McCarthy of Lifting for Life and No Bullshit Bodybuilding. It's been a long time since I've said that, at least uh, actually in a video, and it feels good. So I'm back for this video, and we will see what happens moving forward. Um, I want to talk to you today about melatonin, specifically melatonin dosing, as this has been a topic I've been borderline obsessed about recently. It has fascinated me, and more than that, um, I think most people, as a result of what uh, supplement companies are putting in their products, are taking way more melatonin than they need to be taking. So, a little bit of context. Um, in case you don't know, I don't want to assume that you do. Um, melatonin is a neurohormone secreted by the pineal gland at night in response to darkness. And what's interesting about melatonin is it doesn't seem to act as a sedative in the traditional sense of, let's say, Ambien being a sedative. This is something you take and it puts you to sleep. Rather, melatonin appears to be one of the most significant cues for your overall circadian rhythm. So rather than melatonin directly putting you to sleep, it seems more to be something like it starts the process that ultimately results in you falling asleep. And, and, it, and interestingly, the period between which melatonin is naturally secreted and when people naturally go to sleep seems to be some number of hours. There's a little bit of controversy there resulting from uh, improvements in the accuracy of the, the tools that we're using to, to measure plasma melatonin levels. Um, I don't recall the numbers off the top of my head, and I don't want to give you the wrong numbers, but I know that when melatonin is actually secreted, when we have measured that occurring, has been pushed back as a result of more accurate techniques for measuring plasma or blood melatonin concentrations. So that's what melatonin is and what it does. And I haven't really said anything in that explanation about supplements. Now, melatonin, like many other things which are naturally produced in the body, uh, can be taken in supplemental form. So to probably over-explain that point, if you can imagine um, glutamine is naturally produced in the body. It's a, it's a conditionally essential amino acid, maybe not the best example, but there are a number of non-essential amino acids that are synth synthesized endogenously. So synthesized in the body, you don't uh, have to ingest them. And that's the case with melatonin your body is able to synthesize it without you ingesting it directly, although it is in some foods. In particular, I think bananas, oranges, a few others have been tested. Literally, give people bananas. Okay, everyone act like monkeys. Really fantastic humor. And then they measure plasma melatonin concentrations and they actually see some changes there, although they likely are not significant enough to do anything. So again, melatonin gets produced naturally, can be taken in supplemental form. What's the deal about dosage? Well, at some point, I'm not recalling the year, lower doses of melatonin, meaning 0.3 micrograms, or excuse me, 300 micrograms, which is 0.3 milligrams, up to one milligram, uh, was actually patented by a researcher, a group of researchers uh, working at MIT. This is many years ago now, such that the patent has expired. And what a bit of a digression here, something that's interesting about patents is they don't necessarily apply just to a thing. It isn't you make this drug and this drug at any dosage is patented. An example, um, I actually I have the patent here, the sustained release delivery, might as well read it to you, not the whole thing. Uh, United States patent couch at all, um, a sustained release delivery of amphetamine salts. So this is Adderall XR. Adderall XR wasn't just patented uh, across the board, rather they patented Adderall XR 20 milligrams. They specifically patented for that dosage. So similarly with melatonin, based on research done on low dosages of melatonin, a milligram or less, a patent was filed and uh, I believe it was given to them. I actually haven't confirmed that part. So it's what seems to have happened was companies in wanting to work around this patent simply came out with melatonin products with three milligrams or five milligrams or 10 milligrams. And it seems that no one really expected this to happen in that 
what had been researched and shown to be ideal, and I'll get to that a little bit more, was these lower dosages. So the FDA didn't really come in. They didn't expect people to, to produce higher dosed products. Now, if we actually look at the literature, and if I were better at making videos, I would show it to you here, but I'll link everything that I can in the description box below. If we look at the melatonin literature, one of the first things that's striking about it is there's actually very little, or relatively little, uh, very relatively little, in the way of dosage comparisons. So when it comes to melatonin treating what's called uh, delayed, sleep, uh, delayed sleep onset, so going to sleep too late, waking up too late, there are about seven studies that I know of, and all of them but two just used five milligrams, and that was it, and they... Um, measured the results of taking five milligrams of melatonin hours before sleep, and it does work. But what the problem with that is all it tells you is five milligrams of melatonin works. It doesn't tell you if 10 would work better, if 15 would work better than 10, if 50 would work 10 times better than five, if 0.5 milligrams would work the same as five or less, and so on. So I don't want to say that that research is worthless, but it... Um, it doesn't really tell us about dosage. It just tells us this is one dosage that works in this way. Now, the research that actually compares dosages, there are three that I can think of off the top of my head that compared, I think three, four, compared typically 0.3 milligrams, so 300 micrograms to three milligrams. And then in the original patent for melatonin, it was 0.1 milligrams, 0.3, 1, and 10. In that patent application, what that data indicated was one milligram worked the best. And what they found was 0.1 just really wasn't enough, 0.3 was significantly better, one was slightly better than 0.3, and one was better than 10. So really, I want to emphasize that point. One milligram worked better than 10 milligrams. And what this means, and we see this over and over again, we see that 0.3 works the same or marginally better, typically not statistically significantly better than three milligrams. And we see that melatonin doesn't have what's called a linear dose response curve. So it is not the case that the more melatonin you take, the better it works. Rather, there's a certain minimum threshold. If I had to bet, I would bet it's between 0.1 and 0.3 milligrams for it to become uh, meaningfully effective. And then there's likely a range where if I had to bet between 0.3 and 1, um, I actually don't know. I think there's the... Let me back up a little bit. What happens between 0.3 milligrams and 1 milligram of supplemental melatonin is in terms of the increase in plasma melatonin, you go from the physiological range, so that which would occur normally at night in response to darkness, which also, by the way, means that light inhibits natural melatonin production. In going from 0.3, micro, 0.3 milligrams to one, you move plasma melatonin concentrations resulting from supplementation move into the supraphysiological range, the range above that which would be naturally produced. Indeed, one milligram compared to 0.3 in one study produced about five times more. So it's about three times more, but actually resulted in a peak elevation in plasma melatonin of about five times higher. And so intuition might suggest more is better, it's just gonna knock you out. Like if you, maybe you take 10 milligrams and it's basically just as uh, effective as a sleeping pill. The data just doesn't support that. Um, that is what a linear dose response curve would be. You get more, like dose goes up and the, the response in terms of beneficial response goes up in a linear fashion. What we actually get with melatonin is an inverted U-curve where, or at the very least, we get initially something like a linear dose response curve to a certain threshold in the neighborhood of or between 0.3 milligrams and 1 milligram based on the available data. There's a little bit of divergence there. And then above that, you don't get additional beneficial effects in terms of reduce sleep latency, which is the main thing melatonin does. It decreases the time it takes you to go to sleep. Or sleep efficiency, which melatonin typically doesn't improve, but in, in at least one study on elderly insomniacs, all of these are going to be in the description box below, 
sleep efficiency was improved by melatonin. These things just don't get better beyond a milligram in any of the research I've seen that compares dosages. And none of this, and I've now been talking for 10 minutes, none of this mentions side effects. Um, one might think that because melatonin is naturally uh, produced in the body, that it, by default it's safe. But again, 0.1 to 0.3 milligrams supplementally will elevate melatonin in the way that melatonin would naturally be secreted, assuming you don't have some kind of circadian rhythm disorder that could disturb that. I think some people actually don't naturally secrete melatonin. Um, so I think that it's... I think one could say that the, the default assumption should be that those supplemental dosages should be safe because they just mirror what the body does naturally, Worst case scenario, you somehow screw up your circadian rhythm by taking it at the wrong time. But that isn't so much an issue of, is it, uh, at bottom, is it safe? With these supraphysiological dosages, we can't assume safety precisely because that elevation in blood melatonin wouldn't happen naturally. So you have to investigate safety through, really ideally you would investigate the safety of all dosages, but especially these supraphysiological, or um, they're sometimes called uh, pharmacological because they're, that would actually be a medical intervention type dosage, and you have to investigate the safety of those on their own. And what's actually been found is there are negative uh, effects arising from these higher dosages. In the study on the elderly I mentioned, three milligrams induced hypothermia. Now you can ask a question of how meaningful that is. That's a legitimate question, but nonetheless it happened. It didn't happen with lower dosages of melatonin. And it didn't happen in the placebo group. So this isn't something that happens naturally. It's induced by megadosing melatonin. In addition, melatonin is very rapidly metabolized. The half-life, the highest, it's going to vary between individuals, by the way, depending on uh, liver enzyme activity. So I actually have the A, A allele of the enzyme that metabolizes melatonin. This is something I've had tested. So I metabolize it ultra rapidly. Most people don't. And the, the longest half-life I've seen is 65 minutes with the shortest being 35. So melatonin is very rapidly metabolized. Nonetheless, if you increase plasma melatonin many, many times above where it would be naturally, the fact that it's metabolized rapidly gets overridden by the fact that you've taken so much. And then you wake up the next day and you have melatonin floating around when it should be practically zero. Um, just as adenosine should be very low after sleeping. So you're essentially inverting what you want here. You want melatonin to be extremely low or you know, practically not present when you wake up and throughout the day and then you want it to be elevated before bed. You take too much before bed, even though it's very rapidly metabolized, it's still gonna be floating around. And this is what seems to induce next day drowsiness or grogginess. Something else that we've seen, not, excuse me, dry mouth. Um, I haven't seen this in any of the research, but it, it's relatively common anecdotally. Uh, people will deal with irritation, uh, irritability, the, the day following supplementing with melatonin. I think this is an anti-dopaminergic effect. So melatonin, and this quickly gets into mechanistic, mechanistic stuff that I don't understand fantastically well, despite having read the relevant literature repeatedly. Melatonin appears to directly block dopamine secretion. Dopamine is a neurotransmitter implicated in things like sexual arousal, and mood, uh, executive functioning, so things like uh, impulse control, uh, cognitive flexibility, and so on. Many, many important cognitive functions. Melatonin seems to block the secretion of, uh, or the release of dopamine, which is beneficial in the context of, of going to sleep. You're preventing the secretion of an excitatory neurotransmitter, but it seems that if people blow past a certain threshold, so let's say potentially anything above a milligram of supplemental melatonin, it, my personal hypothesis is that it's having an anti-dopaminergic effect that's then resulting in irritability. Gets complicated because uh, irritability associated with like autism spectrum disorder seems to have something to do with 
excessive glutamate, glutamate being another excitatory neurotransmitter. So this hypothesis is unproven and could easily be false, but that's the best I'm able to come up with because that would also explain that that would be consistent with an overall antidopaminergic effect. You have someone who's irritable and unusually sedated when they wake up. And the, the, some of this is hypothetical, but the fact that melatonin can remain elevated following supplemental megadosing is unambiguous. That is actually in the literature. So my recommendation is to take uh, 300 micrograms, 0.3 milligrams. Timing is another issue, but my best guess is that immediately before bed, if you're taking it for the purpose of falling asleep immediately, if you're trying to alter your circadian rhythm, you can take the same dosage seven hours prior to sleep. That's a research-based recommendation that I don't want to expand on here, given the length of this video already. Um, and as far as I'm able to discern, you could do both of those in one day. So seven hours before when you want to sleep, you take 300 micrograms. It's not going to be such a big elevation that you're going to get, you know, be knocked out in the middle of the day. Somehow that affects your circadian rhythm. We don't know how. And then you can take another 300 micrograms before bed. And for either of these, you could make an argument for up to one milligram. The only research-based uh, argument one like that I know of would be based on the original patent. You could say one milligram slightly outperformed 300 micrograms, but I very much, I think the fact that as dose scales up, we start seeing adverse effects, I would argue for minimum effective dose. I'm, I feel like I'm uh, quoting Mike Isratel here, but this is, this is not a case where you simply want to go more and more and more. Three is better than one, five is better than three, etc. cetera. Uh, one other thing in terms of diverse effects, and I'll leave the video here, is rebound effects where, for example, when I take 10 milligrams, it knocks me out quickly, but then it reliably wakes me up about four hours later. What I'm thinking is happening is melatonin is hugely elevated, rapidly metabolized, levels then drop back down very rapidly, and boom, you get woken up. Um, I've experienced this with everything from three milligrams up to 10. I've never experienced it with lower dosages. And that's, it's, that's a cool effect. Uh, it happened to me in an airport once, and I was just strolling around at 4 a.m. It felt like it was the middle of the day. But that generally isn't conducive to actually living life in the way you want to. You want to sleep a seven hour or eight hour or nine hour block, 12 hour, 15 hour, 30 hour at a time. And not, you know, four hours and then you're up and super alert and it's four hours before your alarm. So again, start with 0.3 milligrams equivalent to 300 micrograms. And I will put in the description box below the particular product I use. I'm not affiliated with them or anything like this, but it's just the product that I've used and have had success with. Hope that was intelligible given how dry my mouth is. Best to have a, a bottle of water. Learn from Marco Rubio. Thank you so much for watching. If you found any value in the video, please do like it. Feel free to comment below. Nice to be back. I don't know if or and or when I, I'll be back again, but I enjoyed this. Stay safe, don't do drugs, and I can't remember how I used to end videos. Thanks for watching, guys. It was nice to do this.